you know what? I completely forgot. It's my little girl's birthday. Oh, can you help us out? Come on. No, it isn't. <laughs> Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down the top 20 horribly awkward TV cameos. Well, you know something, brother, what he doesn't understand is that Hulkamania is gonna be running wild, dude. For this list, we'll be looking at the most horrible celebrity cameos from throughout TV history. These cameos can be awkward in numerous ways, including being misplaced, unnecessary, or poorly acted. Which of these cameos made you cringe the most? Let us know in the comments. Hey Mojoholics! For a chance to win cash prizes, play our live daily trivia challenges every day at 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern only at watchmojo.com slash play. Number 20, Boy George, the A-Team. Yeah, I'm looking for Cowboy George. Well, I'm almost I'm on Boy George High. Can you think of a more awkward pairing than Boy George in this squad? The A-Team was a very popular show in the mid-1980s. It followed four Special Forces veterans who escape from a military prison and work as mostly do-gooder mercenaries. Although comical in spots, it was constantly being criticized for its sexism and violence, which is why the inclusion of Boy George was so jarring. In the show, Boy George wins over Mr. T's B.A. Baracus and ends up performing to a bar full of tough, country-loving good old boys. We're not sure, but we highly doubt that Culture Club is their kind of music. Can anyone say ratings ploy? Nonsense. Everybody likes Culture Club. Number 19, Will I Am, Joan of Arcadia. You wanna play? It's a trick. You think I can see you, Joan? We're not dogging Will I Am's acting chops here, because he's actually not half bad. We're just docking points for how unnecessary his cameo is. In the episode Independence Day, he appears as God in the form of a three-card Monty player and gives Joan some advice about life, but using the card con as a metaphor. You gotta keep your eyes open so you can see all the moves. His inclusion in the episode is really unnecessary, as a regular actor would really do just fine, and it simply comes across as pandering to Joan of Arcadia's teenage audience. That said, if you didn't know who Will I Am is, you probably wouldn't even know it's anyone special. Come on, keep your eyes on the queen. Number 18, Tom Morello, Star Trek Voyager. Captain on the deck. The worst kinds of cameos are the obvious ones, such as the case with Tom Morello appearing as crewman Mitchell. In the scene, Mitchell randomly appears and gives Janeway directions. The two then share a brief, awkward conversation, complete with Morello looking directly into the camera before Janeway walks away. Crewman Mitchell. How have you been? Uh, never better, ma'am. Morello is a fan of Star Trek, and the son of series producer Rick Berman is a fan of Morello's work in Rage Against the Machine and Audio Slave. The scene, which could have easily been cut from the episode, screams, we just wanted to hang out with Tom Morello for a day. Uh, to the left, ma'am. Thank you. Number 17, Wayne Gretzky, The Young and the Restless. It's not too often you see pro athletes make cameos in television series, and even less so with soap operas. Here's why. Wayne Gretzky is far and away the greatest scorer the NHL has ever seen, but his acting chops could use some work. Surprisingly enough, the character he played was supposedly a mob boss in the episode, but you wouldn't exactly know it from Gretzky's stiff and emotionless delivery. And this is uh, Wayne, out of our Edmonton operation. Sure could use some of your class around home. Even though it's only a couple lines long, the whole scene feels forced and unnecessary, and Gretzky's probably the least intimidating mob boss ever put to screen. Visiting, mister? Call me Wayne. Everybody does. We're guessing it wasn't long after this appearance that the Great One put his acting career on ice. Number 16, Alice Cooper, Monk. He's the guy. Who's the guy? Alice Cooper? In the episode Mr. Monk and the Garbage Strike, the garbage collectors of San Francisco go on strike, and Monk grows delirious from the smell of garbage. While single-handedly cleaning up the city, Monk tells his colleagues that he has solved the murder on his mind. Alice Cooper must have read about Jimmy Cusack's handcrafted wingback chair. As he explains, the real Alice Cooper is a collector of antique wing chairs and committed murder when he discovered that the head of the sanitation union had one that he wanted. While this is being explained, Alice can be seen snarling at the camera and caressing a chair. It's very weird and very awkward, but then again, that's Monk for you. Number 15, Michael Stipe, The Adventures of Pete and Pete. What can I get you, son? How about a sludge sickle? R.E.M. was all the rage in the early 1990s, and their popularity resulted in one incredibly awkward cameo from the band's singer, Michael Stipe. 
In a special episode of Pete and Pete, Stipe appears as a sludge sickle vendor named Captain Scrummy. And while Stipe is a great singer, as an actor, he's, well... You'll have to talk to Mr. Tasty if it's a blue tornado you're after. Look, we understand that Pete and Pete is intentionally corny and ridiculous, but there's a difference between good corny acting and bad corny acting. This is the latter. Stipe makes some truly weird facial expressions, and his voice stays in a sleep-inducingly monotone throughout the entire scene. It's surreal, but not in a good way. You look like a bona fide sludge sickle man. Number 14, Larry David, Hannah Montana. Does anybody work here? <laughs> if there's a group of people who would appreciate a Larry David cameo, it's Hannah Montana's demographic, right? Larry David, creator of two of the most acclaimed comedies in television history, Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm, seemingly randomly appeared in the episode My Best Friend's Boyfriend, playing the typical Larry David character. You know what? I completely forgot. It's my little girl's birthday. Oh, can you help us out? Come on. No, it isn't. He certainly wasn't bad by any means. In fact, he was quite funny. It's just incredibly jarring seeing a comedy legend appear in a children's show, and his brand of comedy doesn't really mesh with that of Hannah Montana's. It's, it's our birthday. I, how did I screw that up? Mine was two months ago. You want to eat? David's appearance allowed him to get his real daughters, who are big fans on the show, but that doesn't excuse the awkward pairing. Are you kidding? Number 13, Quentin Tarantino, All-American Girl. Hi, excuse me, is Mr. Kimmett? Look, we all know that Quentin Tarantino is one of the best directors of the past few decades. That said, everyone also knows he isn't the strongest actor, especially when he puts himself in scenes alongside titans like Samuel L. Jackson and Jamie Foxx. Quentin appeared in one episode of the short-lived ABC sitcom All American Girl. I do a lot of business with the Korean community, and uh, I always believe, mark of a good salesman, speak your customer's language. Yeah, the constant Tarantino jokes were fun, but the dude was his usual fast-talking, awkward self. If that wasn't bad enough, his on-screen chemistry with Margaret Cho was, well, they weren't very compatible. Let's just say that. It's weird to think that Tarantino went from Pulp Fiction directly to whatever this was. Okay, Desmond, thanks for stopping by. Number 12, Macy Gray, Fuller House. Oh my God, it's Macy Gray. Call it an awkward cameo for an awkward show. In Fuller House's third episode, wittingly titled Funner House, the gang runs into Macy Gray at a nightclub. Hey, DJ Tan! <laughs> I haven't seen you since that elephant ride in Cambodia. Okay, let's get the obvious out of the way first. Why Macy Gray? She may be a great singer and talent, but her last big hit was in, like, 1999. We don't think the demand for Macy Gray cameos are very high. Our question is answered later in the episode, when Gray awkwardly plugs her new album. Although, the following dig at herself is admittedly quite funny. It's the one redeeming aspect of this otherwise cringy and terribly acted cameo. This is from my new album called The Way. You can buy it online or out of the trunk of my car. <laughs> Number 11, Donald Trump, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Look, folks, before we go too far, I've got something to tell you. It's Donald Trump. Need we say more? In the fourth season episode, For Sale by Owner, the family is offered an exorbitant amount of money for their house by a mysterious buyer. This buyer turns out to be none other than the Trumpmeister himself. I like keeping a low profile. <laughs> Donnie T awkwardly appears to be an incredibly lame and overly scripted fanfare, including an exaggerated announcement and Carlton fainting in excitement. Trump then awkwardly acts and prances away around the set, delivering horribly timed monotone lines before leaving barely two minutes later. Come on, Fresh Prince, you're better than this. What did you do? Everybody's always blaming me for everything. <laughs> Number 10, Lance Bass, Seventh Heaven. So I guess we have a date tonight, huh? Yeah. Some musicians and singers beautifully transition from music to acting, and some don't. Case in point, InSync's Lance Bass, who appeared as Rick Palmer in an episode of Seventh Heaven. This was Bass's first role in television, and it shows. His acting is painfully wooden and emotionless, and his line delivery is stilted, like he's reading off a cue card just off screen. We were just experimenting with what happens when friends kiss friends. 
This episode aired in January of 2000, the same month NSYNC's Bye 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 debuted, and only two months before their most successful album, No Strings Attached, was released. This show was geared towards teens and preteens, hence Bass's blatantly commercial cameo. Why not just get JT in there? That would have been somewhat better. Well, yeah, my brother Rick's right here, and he says he'd love to take Lucy out. I didn't say that. Number 9. Paris Hilton, Veronica Mars. No one cares what you think, Veronica Mars. Not anymore. Paris Hilton has made numerous cameos over the years, like when she appeared as a goddess on Supernatural, and as you can probably imagine, they have all been very jarring. Her most awkward cameo is arguably her appearance as Caitlin Ford in the second episode of Veronica Mars. Here, she's given an important role, but her character falls wicked flat. What's Troy doing talking to Veronica? It seems incredibly out of character for the new show to do a cameo like this, and it reeks of network meddling. It's as if UPN wanted to pander to his viewers, and was willing to jeopardize the quality and identity of its show to do so. So, aren't you supposed to be going back east for school? Number 8. Jean-Claude Van Damme. Friends. Jean-Claude Van Damme! I didn't know he was in this movie, he is so hot! We know we just said that we wouldn't be taking acting ability into account, but holy cow, is Jean-Claude Van Damme really not in his element here? Granted, he was never really known for his acting prowess, but rather for his fighting skills. She thinks you're cute. <laughs> you don't think I'm cute? Jean-Claude Van Damme appeared in the Friends Season 2 episode, the one after the Super Bowl, and that title is rather indicative of the episode's overall quality. Because Rachel told me uh, you were dying to have a threesome with me and uh, Drew Barrymore. <laughs> but by the way, Drew has some ground rules. <laughs> It's clear that they wanted to capture as many demographics as possible, which included fans of football and of Van Damme, who wouldn't normally tune into Friends. His awkward and chemistry-free inclusion felt like a relatively obvious ratings ploy. Can't you see what's going on here? This man is dying! Uh... Number 7. Pete Wentz, One Tree Hill. Yeah, I heard that band sucks. The bass player's pretty cool. Some musicians make a flawless transition from music to screen, Think Will Smith or David Bowie. Others like Pete Wentz should probably stay in the recording booth. Wentz, the bassist and lyricist of rock band Fall Out Boy, appeared with the entire band in the One Tree Hill episode and attempt to tip the scales, playing their song Dance Dance. Fair enough. A scripted performance by a popular band is always a welcome addition to any teen-centric series. However, things get a little dicey when Wen starts dating Peyton later in the season. I thought you were blowing me off. I said I'd be here. Uh, <laughs> He's not the greatest actor, and his forced inclusion feels more like fan baiting than any worthwhile story addition. I mean, even though we just met each other, I feel like I know you pretty well. Number six, Chris Brown, The O.C. Seeing the world through the eyes of an animal forces us to see the world, and ourselves, in a new light. Thank you. Chris Brown appeared for a three-episode arc in the fourth season of The O.C., which aired in 2007. Yes, this was before the Rihanna incident, when Chris Brown was a significantly less loaded name. But this O.C. cameo wasn't very good nonetheless. Brown plays Will, an intelligent student who takes the rebellious Caitlyn under his wing as her tutor, and the two soon grow in attachment. Kind of weird since we barely studied last night. It's typical high school drama TV, but it's brought down by Brown's rather inadequate acting. He mumbles through his lines, delivers them as if he's reading off a cue card, and conveys the same expression no matter the content of the scene. I thought you liked it. Number 5. Kevin Federline, CSI Crime Scene Investigation. Man, you're weak, 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 weak. Remember when Kevin Federline was a thing? Federline appeared in the season 7 episode of CSI entitled Fanny Smackin and it was every bit as embarrassing as you would imagine. You're a joke. He played Cole Tritt, the ringleader of a gang, and in one scene, Federline being punched in the stomach after taunting Nick. <laughs> this moment almost seems to be some form of wish fulfillment, as Federline's reputation was still in the dumps around the time of this episode's initial airing, mostly for leaving the pregnant Char Jackson for Britney Spears some time before. The question this cameo raises is why cast Federline when a more experienced actor could do better? Anybody get that on video? Man, I'll take a picture myself. Number 4. Bristol Palin, The Secret Life of the American Teenager. I left you a note on the door last night, but I see it's still there. Was it really necessary to cast Bristol Palin, daughter of the often mocked politician Sarah Palin? We'll answer that for you, now. With this performance, Bristol proved that she has no business or future in scripted television, 
delivering arguably one of the most uncomfortable performances in popular television history. We're all teen moms and musicians. Her line delivery is utterly robotic, and her facial expression never changes. It's like watching a cyborg or a video game dialogue sequence in real life. It's so forced that you assume the character is supposed to be acting off, as if she's setting up Amy to be murdered just outside the room. You're the world's greatest French horn player, and I'm Yo-Yo Ma. Number three, Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, and Ric Flair. Baywatch. Well, you know something, brother. What he doesn't understand is that Hulkamania is going to be running wild, dude. The 80s and 90s boasted some of the most iconic wrestlers in the history of the industry, such as Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, and Ric Flair. You know what else was popular in the 90s? Baywatch. And you better believe that the two were brought together. The result? One of the most silly episodes of television you'll ever watch. We'll get rid of our red, because the yellow is more than their color. Three wrestlers appeared in the episode Bash at the Beach, fittingly named after, and shamelessly promoting, the WCW pay-per-view event. The story revolved around Ric Flair challenging both Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage to a wrestling match to decide the fate of a youth center. We wish we were making this up. <laughs> Number two, Kim and Khloe Kardashian. 90210. Well, nothing says you're back like backless. These two aren't number one for the sole reason of their being Kardashians. Even Snoop Dogg was really awkward on 90210, and we love us some Snoop Dogg. Don't even trip. I got my new single in the car. You want to hear? To the Kardashians' credit, they aren't the worst actresses ever. It's just a completely pointless and grating scene that serves no purpose other than to scream, Look, we have the Kardashians on our show! And to promote their sister's expensive and luxurious clothing line. Naomi, we're running a business here. Combine a cringeworthy storyline, some could-be-better performances, and shameless celebrity advertising, and you've got a god-awful TV cameo for the ages. Kim, that's it. We're out of here. You better stay out of our store. Oh. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, Justin Bieber, CSI Crime Scene Investigation. Where's your gun, your vest, your badge? Who on earth greenlighted Justin Bieber to be in an episode of CSI? Oh, excuse us, two episodes of CSI, because why not? Bieber appeared in the 11th season as Jason McCann, a serial killer and bomber. Yes, they cast Justin Bieber as a serial killer, and that was the moment when many fans would say CSI lost all credibility. I can't. They will kill me. Bieber's acting is wooden at best, and his boyish appearance and squeaky voice is about as threatening as your kindly grandmother who bakes cookies. He he's wired, he's got a bomb! He's like, there's no bomb! And then they shoot him, which, like Federline, was almost certainly scripted solely to go viral. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.